Well, while our, our speakers uh, join us up on the stage, I would like to just, again, highlight for you what the strategy of this symposium is, and that is relatively shorter talks with lots of time for discussion. So we've carved out a half an hour now for us to really think through some of the things that we've heard. I think you've got some of the world's experts up here on uh, cardiometabolic, cardio kidney uh, disease. Uh, and I think it now's the time for us to really begin thinking about some of the burning questions that uh, that that are surely um, everyone has. And if, if it's all right, I would like to uh, I'll take the opportunity to start. If you have questions from the audience, please feel free to get up to the microphone. So, so, Joe, why don't you go ahead and start, and but I and I'll uh, I'll follow you. Okay. So, we talked about zip codes. We talked about ethnic backgrounds, financial aspects of where you live. Christy talked about cheap, old medicines that work. But why is it that when I see patients with metabolic syndrome, and they might be seeing a cardiologist, we record a blood pressure of 155 over 80. We look at the patient with despair, and we ask them, what is your cardiology saying? Cardiologist saying. And they say, it's OK. What, what do you say? This is my frustration. So it's, this is a, a very frustrating issue that, unfortunately, uh, cardiologists tend to think that hypertension should be done by the primary care physician. And they're, they're focusing on procedures and testing and we get into an entire another issue of what gets rewarded in our healthcare system. And unfortunately, people say, well, in the United States, people do much, to, they, do, they do too many procedures and they do too much testing. You want to know why? Because that's what the insurance companies pay for. And physicians and the hospitals make more money by doing more tests and more procedures. And that's where the focus is. We do live in a capitalist system. That's the way it works. So the incentives need to be better aligned with what the outcomes needed for the patients. The work RVU system doesn't work for cardiology. I'm a chief of cardiology and it's ridiculous. Uh, outpatient care for treating hypertension and things like this should be more of the focus. Uh, and so I don't know how we change all of that, but it is, it is so disheartening to see people with hypertension not treated well. And then the patients are like, well, it's borderline. And the other way, even in you know, home blood pressure monitoring with inexpensive devices, it's to me one of the most frustrating aspects of medicine is the something as fundamental as high blood pressure, where, where we now have very good agents that we don't use them. I, I'll just add that I think there's also some reluctance in adopting the new data from Sprint. And I think in family medicine and, and also in cardiology where lower is better has not had as much acceptance among some of the traditional cardiologists as traditional primary care doctors. And if the patient is feeling well and their blood pressure is 140, 150, there's this tendency of not to rock the boat or change things and they may get dizzy. And, and I think there's more, I think, perceived harm than uh, like banking on the literature that exists to support. And now they have been served two other trials since Sprint from China that have shown consistent benefit of lowering blood pressure below 120. But still, I think uh, in Europe, as well as in, in certain communities in our healthcare uh, in US, there is not that acceptance. Because if someone is feeling well, we don't want to change things in a 20 minute period of uh, clinic interaction that we have. There's no use of home blood pressure, so we have no idea what your actual blood pressure at home is. So as uh, Christy was pointing out, I think we just need to do better with more longitudinal care and not just treat patients from clinic visits to clinic visits. If we had a better assessment of home blood pressure, we can actually target better and the patients can be made aware of their risk much uh, in, in a much better fashion than one single blood pressure. And often there's a discordance in home blood pressure and clinic visits. So I think, so there is a lot more that needs to be done from awareness standpoint and from assessment standpoint as well. I'll just add, I mean, the point is extremely well taken. Uh, I mean, there is therapeutic inertia. Uh, we, all, we all have seen those examples when a patient comes in with a systolic of 140 and you ask the resident, keep repeating it till it goes to 120. 
and then we'll say the blood will record that blood pressure, right? So uh, there is a lot of therapeutic inertia in what we do. Uh, the, the other aspect of this is I think who owns the patient. Uh, and that is what I was showing you on the last slides that uh, when you have these things, well, that patient is owned by everybody. And that's where, especially for this syndrome, there is this concept of having a CKM coordinator. But I think at the very basic level, we all need to own that patient. So if I am a cardiologist, I should not only be concerned about my tests and my procedures, I should be concerned about managing risk factors as well, because at the end of the day, that is what really matters. Although the system is totally flipped on its head, I get paid more for doing procedures and, uh, and ordering tests than actually managing uh, somebody's blood pressure, cholesterol, or lipids, or, or, or even C. So. So I'll just try to expand on this a little bit further. I, I'm interested in the idea about patients being on therapy and at target. And I'd like each of you to sort of tackle what, what are our targets today based on the data for each of those risk factors? Where should we be trying to get our patients? And, and I'd, to, get, to amplify one of Dr. Go, Dr. Gulati's point, how many people do we have come into the office and say, you know, my blood pressure at home is fine. I know it's 150 here because I have white coat hypertension. What, what does that mean for us when we walk out of here and go to the office this afternoon or Monday morning in terms of managing patients? Well, so talk about, so Christy, one of the, talk about the targets. Like, yeah, so one of the things is, is that basically home blood pressure monitoring is essential. And it's also essential that you explain to people is that get a, you know, I like Omron as a good brand. I'm not, I don't get it. I don't have anything to do with Omron, but it's a, it's a, it's a good blood pressure. Get the one on the arm. Make sure they sit with both feet on the ground. They sit quietly. They check their blood pressure. And if it's elevated, they wait five minutes and check it again. Then wait five minutes, check it again. And then you can look at what are those three readings. The machine keeps the readings on it. You can have these. Some of the machines will send it to the office. But I like for people to keep track and then send me information as that what are their home blood pressure readings, just like you were saying, because I think that really is important. There are some people who just, you know, Houston traffic, they see in the office, they're a little anxious and their blood pressure is high, but at home it's maybe in the 120s. So the, one of the challenges is the intensity of therapy is dependent upon the risk of the patient. And I'm sure Kern will have his... So some people keep talking about what is it a calcium score or something, Karim? I mean, but, uh, <laughs> but 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 basically, you know, there are some tests which give a lot of predictive value for being a high risk patient. Uh, it turns out that for blood pressure, you know, it's it's, it's it's some of the things Joe is you know EKG with LVH. If the when you see diastolic dysfunction, left atrial enlargement on echo. I used to write that off as a big deal. Everyone's got a slightly enlarged left atrium. Well, it, unfortunately, if you're worried about AFib and stroke, it is a big deal, uh, which most patients are worried about. And this is where the cardiac biomarkers, which are almost never ordered by cardiologists, uh, you know, I got a, a, a niece who you know, was just talked to yesterday, and she'd had chemotherapy and a bunch of other things, but she'd been foot swelling and short of breath. Nobody checked a BNP. So she goes to the ER and it's 3,000. I mean, give me a break. Uh, it's just, but, but it, there are tests you can do that will tell you something about cardiac function. And if it's abnormal, we need to be more aggressive. The sprint was high risk people. There are low risk people who probably, you know, somebody who's 80 years old and they're 145 and they have everything beautiful uh, uh, with it, you know, that's probably okay. But you need to, this is the challenge is I, the, personalization, you know, prevent, he talked about. Uh, so we need to do that because the, the targets differ by what the risk is. Not everybody needs to be at 120, but if you're at high risk, it's a good level. For LDL, I mean, I think the optimal LDL is if you've got bad disease, if you've had a recurrent ACS, it's probably more like 30 or 40, but for primary prevention in a healthy person, I don't need to get there. Yeah, I think, uh, the, the, in the current era, I think we have to focus on a risk-based approach to prevention because it's really, if everyone who needs to be on weight loss therapies and GLP-1s and SGLD-2 inhibitor is on it just by like guideline indication, then the health system will be bankrupt. And I think we cannot afford that at this 
stage. So CAC score, biomarkers, and even in Sprint, there has been a biomarker-based analysis that Christy and others have done and shown that the greatest benefit is in the highest risk patients. And I think identifying that and using biomarkers or CAC to de-risk patients and then having that conversation with patients that, yes, you have overall very low risk, so the return on investment on getting your blood pressure to 115 may not be as high is meaningful. And I think the risk-based approach to allocating expensive but effective therapies has to be the mantra for current health systems as more and more expensive but effective therapies are coming out. Her. Uh, well, uh, I'll start by first of all thanking both Christy and Embrish for giving a shout out to the power of zero. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, but again, Joe, what a wonderful meeting and, you know, just having the treat to have all the three cardiometabolic experts in clinical domain trials, health systems, population health. I, I, I just wanted to get all of your thoughts on the big dilemma that now we are having, who do we need to treat? especially with the GLP-1s. If you look at those with established cardiovascular disease, we estimate that almost every three in four patients with established cardiovascular disease is a candidate, either by select or sustain, and we're still waiting for more data on Tercepid-5. Um, the costs are enormous uh, from a health system uh, as well as the peers' perspective. And not to also account the fact that we have huge disparities in who can afford and cannot, especially in underserved populations, minorities, low socioeconomic individuals. There is already a concern and data coming up on the real challenge of financial toxicity. So the question is, what do you think is the responsibility of the peers, community, health systems coming together that the right people get it, the folks are not led behind. And in this piece, should industry be actively participating, considering the makers being highest GDP than the Denmark, Eli Lilly becoming $1 trillion plus? Do, is there a moral responsibility also subsidizing and reaching out to a group of individuals who need it the most? So that's a big challenge that we are facing. We have therapies majority are getting candidates. The health systems cannot afford it. For employees, the number one rise in cost last year was GLP-1s. Where do we go from here? So, Karam, I can take a stab at it. But, of course, you know, this is a question you've asked that you're not expecting a full answer and a solution from this group because this is something that's faced by everybody, right? Starting from financial toxicity to affordability. I mean, I'll start out with my thoughts, that even when we do these fancy uh, ICERs, right, that, okay, uh, incremental cost effectiveness is 30,000, highly cost effective. Well, it may be highly cost effective, but if a million people in U.S. need a GLP-1 receptor agonist, there is no affordability. If we are going to prescribe those million GLP-1 receptor agonists, well, the system's going to get bankrupt when it comes to cancer therapies, right? So. The pie is the same. It's not that pie is expanding too much every year in terms of healthcare budget that we have. And I think it's the same for other countries. In fact, the other countries are in a much larger hole compared to US when it comes to healthcare expenditures. So that's one point. So I, mean, I think we all share that. Uh, I mean, a few thoughts on this are, I think some of those you alluded to, if you look at the, uh, the amount of profit that a couple of these companies have made, I think there is a more, more moral and social tax Actually, one of them has started spending a lot of money, at least on the research side. I believe the numbers is somewhere around 20, 22% of their profits are spent on research. How much of that can be used towards access, I think is the real issue. I do believe now that we're at a point where you very well articulated that even in those in stage four ASCVD, three out of four, are going to be candidates for GLP-1 receptor. Even in that group, we'll need to decide actually who is the person that we need to give therapy to. And I think the population will need to understand as well, because I think in our country, sometimes there is this thing that I should get any and every therapy, although I might be deriving 5% benefit, and the other person might be deriving, deriving a 50% benefit. So I think that understanding has to happen as well. Two other things that, that I would talk about is the ability to negotiate prices. 
And I know it's a very hot topic in this country. Well, VA has been doing that, right? And you look at actually overall healthcare expenditures and the quality of care. We can debate that, but in general, most will agree that that has been fairly okay in terms of the quality of care. I think Medicare has started to do that now, so hopefully some of that will help. And I know some people may not agree with that approach, uh, but that's one aspect. But I think, you know, I might argue for two, two more things. One is that what we knew in 2010 in terms of therapies that work, even if we implement those, you know, 70, 80% of heart disease, stroke, and heart failure will probably go away just by hypertension just by hypertension, even there with like 30, 40% control rates, right? So I think we need to look at how we make things affordable and find out who those people are. But I might argue that we are at, at least 15, 20 years behind in terms of what we knew then would work that we have not implemented. Statins is another one, blood pressure control, diabetes. So I think these therapies are gonna keep coming next five years. Are we going to start talking about affordability for each one of those? Perhaps we need to ask ourselves what should we should have done before we got to that stage four. And I think that's where all the work that you're doing, others are doing in terms of a systems approach might be, might be a better approach because otherwise we're not gonna be able to play this catch up game with new therapies that are coming in. So those are some very random thoughts, not anything that's close to a solution. Uh, I think uh, what uh, Salim said is exactly right. I think we have lagged much more in implementation science in delivering care. And as you saw some of the data that we presented from NHANES that the percent proportion of individuals with controlled blood pressure has not changed in the last decade or even gone down. Percent proportion with glucose control has not changed, LDL control has not changed. And so th that's not a gap of having effective therapies. That's a gap of delivering the therapies to people who need, need it the most. And there's this classic risk treatment paradox where people who need it the most are least likely to have access. So I think it's not, uh, the, the challenge is not about the pricing of the drugs that we are lacking in. I think the, even if you make the drugs cheaper, you still won't get it to people who need it the most as, a, as seen with hypertension management and with the LDL management. But I think what we need to do is we need to have a system levels approach where we have this risk guided uh, approach. Everyone can be on therapies that can reduce the risk and then you reassess the residual risk and then based on the magnitude of residual risk that can be reduced by more expensive therapies, you allocate those therapies. So if you do blood pressure control in everyone, LDL control in everyone, you are tremendously reducing your absolute risk reduction that you can gain from other more expensive therapies. And then you can use that approach to target patients who are most likely to benefit from these therapies. And, and I think this is where anti-inflammatory therapies are headed, where weight loss, expensive weight loss therapies are headed. So I think that mindset has to be brought in to this implementations of approach in health systems. So uh, you raise a, a number of very important issues that, uh, sorry, this conference is going on right now. The, 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 I was excited about the select study, but I got to say, and if, if you look at the retail price, the, the cost to save an event in that study was astronomical, uh, something I'd never seen before. Uh, and they used to talk about PCSK9s being expensive. I thought, holy cow. Uh, so it, it, there's a couple of things. Uh, you know, one of them is, for example, can we do some things? That, it's wonderful for these agents, but I, uh, uh, Elizabeth Vaughn was at Beta, she's at UTMB now. She has a program, NIH funded, using community health workers to use inexpensive agents. For example, you know, low dose piclidazone with certain sulfonylureas and metformin, triple therapy, oral agents, actually quite effective in terms of getting a, these people with A1Cs that might be nine or 10, bringing them down to seven and six and a half is a big deal and shouldn't be ignored. You may not be able to get the other agents, but even she's focusing on the Hispanic community, community health workers. So the language and then it, it, that she found is that in addition to that, the folk getting access to and follow up with community health workers to improve their hypertension in their lipids. So there's things that can be done that can be using, and some of this is church-based, uh, people who are community health workers doing clinics in different areas that you may not be getting people these agents, but you're improving their care. Uh, now, I was surprised I was in Japan recently in talking to someone 
they were using PCSK9 inhibitors and access problems. And somebody said, well, you know, in, uh, from Hong Kong said, well, you know, in mainland China, they don't have any problem at all. I'm like, what? How can you have a billion plus people and they don't have a problem at all? Well, they got a different price. <laughs> <laughs> so they're a price. I'm like, what? How did they get that price? But you know, I mean, they got a price that uh, is dramatically less than other countries, because I guess the pharmaceutical said, well, if we can get a lower price in a billion people, it's still good money for us. So I do think some of these issues that you're talking about, uh, and 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 also targeting people, because a BMI of 27. It turns out we're just looking at this in the Eric study, trying to see what cost effectiveness would be in the primary prevention or and secondary. But you know, BMI 27, we looked at people who uh, were above or below BMI of 27, they had exactly the same event rate. Uh, it, it, it's not a terribly powerful discriminator of risk, uh, just using an, you know, a dichotomous number like that. Um, so you get a lot of people who are overweight that don't have a high event rate. And it's going to be even worse than a secondary prevention, and they're getting treated right now. So I don't, I don't know. It's going to be big area of research, I think, to figure out how to use these agents wisely. Salim, I'll make one other quick comment, uh, Karam, to your question, which I believe, I hope some people in the room can take this up: is stacking of therapies. I don't think we know right now. We have this bucket list for each of these disease conditions: diabetes, heart failure, ASCVD, stroke. You know, everybody leaves hospital with five or six therapies, and there are two or three we don't prescribe or are not able to prescribe because of the challenges you talked about. I think, you know, in 80s, 90s, it was easy. There was one therapy you had available, two therapies, you just gave those. Right now, I don't know which one to use first. So I think a lot of those need to be looked at again. And I think somebody can make a very big career out of stacking therapies. What comes first in the current era, not based on knowledge from 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. So that's another area that might help with this, with this question. Or, or even deconstructing some of these therapies. Please. Great, thank you. Uh, well, we heard about all these new medications which use metabolic pathways and inhibited stuff, but the cost comparison between the, like for example, atrovastatin and the PCK9 inhibitors is massive. So I guess my question is, is there a real cost effectiveness, especially in the low income zip codes we spoke about? Is and will there ever be a cost effectiveness of giving these incredible medications compared to the normal ones? So these incredible medications will, in the not too distant future, become generic medications and the price will go down. Uh, I was looking at it, for example, loraglutide is generic now. It's a good medication, still expensive, but once you have a few competitors, uh, and, and we'll say that the SEGL2s are starting to go generic, so it takes usually a few years to have two or three of them available, and then you start to get the competition going down. So the hypertension drugs that we use now are all once expensive. Uh, so it will happen. The issue ends up is getting to that period. And as I think everyone's pointed out, is wiser usage of the ones that are inexpensive as first-line therapies in implementing some of this sooner, and even things like perhaps starting a lower dose of a statin where there's fewer side effects, at least perceived side effects, maybe in combination with azetamide, might be a more effective approach than using a high top dose. People, some of that is perception, there's a nocebo effect, but there are also more side effects at the top dose. So different strategies might improve effectiveness. Yes. Hi, I'm Amr. I'm an eye doctor. I'm here with my mentor, Dr. Daniel Goldman. Uh, we don't belong here, but are really excited to learn from all of you smart people. So um, we heard a lot about GLP uh, agents and their exciting benefits on um, the cardiovascular outcomes. Um, but it, unfortunately, in our, in our world, in our clinics, we see patients with diabetic retinopathy um, that, when initiated on GLP agonists, get worse, um, whether they have already progressive disease or no disease at all. Um, and that's supported by literature and in the ophthalmology world, which shows that patients who have diabetic retinopathy or not that are started on GLP agonists have worse eye disease than, say, patients who are started on SGLT2 inhibitors or other novel hypoglycemic agents. So we were wondering if we could just kind of postulate about why that is and what we're seeing. You know, that came up early in, uh, with some aglutide. 
uh, of the issues of the eye. And so I, I don't know if there are strategies where if you were to improve control with other agents before you added this uh, in what is the molecular mechanism, but I think there, it's an important area, obviously. It's a very serious side effect uh, if someone has this. I mean, uh, it is something also where not to, to disparage controlling A1C when it comes to the eye and to the kidney is extremely important uh, with it. So I control with other agents, and I don't know what the data is. If, if someone started off with an A1C of 9.5 versus 7, was there a difference in terms of, you know, what progression of eye disease? I don't, and I don't know the mechanism of that uh, for it, but I think understanding as drugs get used more widely, it is very important to know about the side effects. And unfortunately, we're seeing this, particularly when we're seeing uh, some magnetide in compounding ph pharmacies being used as people getting confused on the dosages and using high dosages and running into some serious side effects with GI motility and you know, bowel obstruction and things like that because they're being used inappropriately. Uh, it's, 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 we need to know the side effects of these agents uh, when used appropriately and inappropriately because we're going to have more and more problems with that. Hi there. Thank you all for your presentations. Dr. Virani, you presented mainly on um, one, one thing that was interesting is a comparison of prevent and the pool cohort equations. Um, and Dr. Pandey, you, you presented about how important it is to look at differences in prescription of drugs such as statins in more underprivileged populations compared to traditional populations. My question for the panel is, we have established, I know Dr. Pandey, you're probably familiar, out of your group, you've published papers that look at if I incorporate social determinants of health in a way to predict something like heart failure, it might improve the predictive power of our model. My question is, at what point do we move from the analysis into what, and what does the implementation look like? Okay, we're, we're, we've identified that certain, social, certain racial groups are generally disadvantaged. What do you do about it? What point do you move from just modeling that and actually doing some kind of an implementation? Yeah, I think that's a great question and that is the crux of the matter in terms of how do we alleviate disparities that we know exist and we know are worsening in terms of cardiovascular disease and cardiometabolic syndrome. And I think modeling and identifying risk is the first step. And I think unless you can quantify risk, you cannot mitigate risk. So unless you know that someone is at an increased risk because where they live or uh, because of their socioeconomic background, you're not gonna think about modifying that risk. And that is the key issue why we want to use prevent or PCE risk scores to identify the high-risk individuals. Now, I think when PCE came out, we were not as focused on social determinants. Actually, race was a, as a, as a covariate in PCE, but I think as we move forward and learned more about the impact of zip codes and all, Prevent score actually incorporates uh, to some degree social determinants of health in their model and they are race agnostic. So I think they have made substantial improvements in identifying risk. Now the question about what do we do with knowing the information is basically when you see a patient and you do the risk assessment and you identify them to be at higher risk, then you have to emphasize at, at a clinician uh, level how to mitigate the risk by using evidence-based therapies uh, cheap or generic blood pressure medications, being more aggressive with risk reduction for blood pressure and for LDL targets. And I think those are the things that need to be emphasized more based on the risk that you assess. And I think if we want to mitigate disparities and this whole conference is about cardiometabolic syndrome, we have to move away from the notion of treating patients and think about treating populations. And I think at a population level, if you can reduce LDL by five or reduce blood pressure by five, MMAG, you can make a much bigger impact than what you would make at a patient level by reducing blood pressure by 20 millimeters of Hg in a poorly controlled blood pressure patient. And the strategies to implement at a population level are much simpler. You don't need a GLP-1 or a PCSK-9 at a population level to move the needle for LDL from whatever it is to five below. That can be done with more use of like a polypill approach or, or statins that are cheap or making statins generic and all these uh, strategies can help. And I think 
for disparities, we just need to make these therapies more accessible to the underserved population. I think the, one of the key issues is going to be basically goes back to primordial prevention, where you know we have to younger people, but healthier lifestyles, so that you don't end up being 35 years old and you're you know you have a BMI of 35, you've got hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and you may be pre-diabetic. At that point, you know the they, what was this, the, the cows were out of the barn, Joe, or something. Yes, like sir. That, you know, but it's uh, say in Nebraska. <laughs> But, you know, one, one point is that, you know, so you talked about that uh, race is a social contract structure. You know, we've got to be a little careful about that because, for example, in biomarkers, the most powerful biomarker that we've seen for cardiovascular is NT pro BNP. But it turns out that if someone is black, African ancestry, the levels are lower. That's not a social construct, that's actually a biological. So that's a misinterpretation of a lab result, that if you see a lower level in perception, if someone's overweight. So some of our, the way we use biomarkers, they're much more powerful if you use it as continuous variables in a multivariate model, uh, which, you know, you do a lot with AI, but I mean, for goodness sakes, we have, you know, EMRs that have all this data in there, but I think it's important that we, you could use this biomarker, but to use it, you do need to consider uh, other other aspects of, you know, sex makes a difference too. And, and so there there are some issues that, and I'm not, so, and I'm not totally certain that hypertension and organ damage for the, even for the same levels is not more severe. Uh, it's someone of African ancestry. Uh, the response to injury, my father was a surgeon. Keloid formation is clearly increased uh, uh, with it, and that's a response to injury of scar tissue. So there are some aspects that are genetic. So I wanted to take up your question and then get back to the, the, the comment that Dr. Ballantyne made. So, so the other thing, look, this is not the first time this question has been asked what you asked, and this is not the last time either. Uh, you know, these are systemic issues we have. So if you look at this presidential advisory that all of us have, you know, cited here, You'll see there's a lot of emphasis on social workers, including the entire team, right? Community health workers. I think Dr. Ballantyne alluded to that as well. And that's what needs to happen. It can be just a clinician's responsibility to take care of everything from transportation difficulty to access related difficulty. So that's one thing I would emphasize on top of what's been mentioned already. I think going back to your point, Dr. Ballantyne, the social construct, the debate we had when this was being developed was that it's not that biology is not different. Biology is captured in risk factors that are there. Now, if somebody put anti pro BNP, then that would be picked up. Hypertension is there. Now, if the treatment is not there or hypertension is more severe, then that number is picked up. So rather than saying that African Americans have a higher risk of heart disease no matter what, and just every time, even with the same blood pressure, that you know, factor we had was increasing the risk for black adults and we were overestimating risk. That was the reason, but I agree with you, it should not be misinterpreted that there is no bio biologic differences across ethnicities. What we're saying in PREVENT is that let's pick it up with the actual risk factor versus just giving extra marks because of your age. That's the, that's the, that's the uh, thinking so behind it. Mendel, we have time for one 15-second question and panel, one 30-second answer. Okay. Very short. About the LOP delay, uh, does it not increase the, during the uh, acute event? Or I think in two studies, it, the, uh, it actually increased after MI. It, it increased with in, in, inflammation, an, an acute stress event like that can increase LPA. Uh, there are things, it's not all you know, renal disease, nephrotic syndrome, there are different things that, medical conditions that can raise LPA levels. Second, very short question. Epilitol A, is it only exclusively uh, associated with LPDL A? Can it not be associated with other Apple B containing lipoproteins, such as VLDL, IDL? So I think you get into some of the particle differences, but it's lipoprotein A is basically, in terms of with the lipoprotein, so there is some free APO A sometimes uh, with it. And that's, we'll have to take a look at this with mugalapin. This is, a, you've seen a new molecule that basically blocks the binding to APO B. Hmm. And uh, so that's gonna be, 
uh, mostly cleared by the kidney. But almost all of it is with the uh, bound ApoB and it's the LPA particle uh, with it. Th those particles may have different compositions in people with high triglycerides or, or other uh, disorders.